it's now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Eklund. Stephen's from the Math Department here in Cambridge, if you don't already know him. Um, and he's a wonderful champion of all things uh, open and sharing code, sharing data. So I'll hand over to Stephen. Thank you very much, um, so, I learn a lot by being around uh, people who I think are a lot more open than me. So, I'm, I, what I'm going to try and do today is describe the sort of the things that I've been doing recently in my uh, in my lab. And uh, ah. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, in particular, the uh, if you think those slides look different, you don't look like PowerPoint, they're not. That's actually an online HTML. I'd like to thank uh, Laurent for helping me fix these up. So, I'm going to actively encourage you to actually, uh, if you're interested, to actually just get the slides from the, uh, the bit.ly link, or somebody can add it to the, the Google Doc. As a relevant point, there's, I'm going to try and do some interactive stuff, right? Interactive stuff never works. I can uh, embarrass myself as an expert and get it all wrong, but maybe if you want to try it later, we should do some of this as well. Um, there are links to various papers. Um, actually, I thought I've been asked to come and speak in somewhere in this post expert era. I think it's worth it. So, you know, fairly established now here in Cambridge. Um, I've learned a lot uh, along the way by, as I said, by hanging out with by much younger people who, who have sort of got this energy and advocates for being open scientists. Um, I'd just like to tell you the story behind this t-shirt that I'm wearing. It's probably the neuroscience shirt for the boss. So there was a meeting in, uh, uh, in the summer where I met this young open scientist called Anthony Gopal, who's now at, uh, he's now actually comes to his PhD at Oxford. So he's in his young 20s. And he tells me what he likes to do at conferences is to go around and harass the publishers. So he goes and he talks to the people like the Elsevier and the Wileys and so forth. So he gives them a hard time about why they aren't as open as they should be in terms of open science. So I thought, oh, I'm going to try this and uh, uh, see how this works. So when I went to this big uh, European neuroscience meeting, I went to the Elsevier stand and asked them about their, their open access policies and everything. It was, I gave them quite a hard time. I felt pretty, uh, pretty happy with myself. So then I went to the PLOS stand. And I thought, well, what can I do with PLOS? I'm pretty happy with PLOS. Um, but I was taught sort of pretty critically about a few things. And then after about 20 minutes of discussing with them, the lady I was with, she sort of looked around. So you can see nobody was coming. She, and so she then sneaked this t shirt out from under the counter. <laughs> we don't have many of these. But we give them to people who we think can, uh, can do us uh, proud in the world. So I got this PLOS shirt and uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to wear it. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking today is really about the, you know, the, the critical thing that Neil has touched on is about how to be an open scientist and get rewarded for it. Right? Because it's all very wrong to be an open scientist. I mean, three years later, you put all this uh, community with material out there. And you don't get your next post up, you don't get your patent recognition. Right? And you see your colleagues who are envied who get these patent recognitions. So I'd like to give you some confidence that this is a process that can work. And uh, I've got some specific tips, I think, that I've learned to try and help you on the way. Um, so I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a maths problem. And then these are a class of problems in mathematics we call inverse problems. Right? And hopefully you will recognize. This kind of thing. This is a grading sheet. Right? So, if you sit an exam and you get a score of 75%, you look across and you see you get a grade A. So, as the examiner, it's a forward problem. Given the percentage, you tell the person to grade. As a student, you get just the grade. And you actually want to solve the inverse problems. What was my actual percentage? Because you can be uh, anywhere in the C band, for example, and not know whether you're close to 50 or 59. So this is a simple problem. In inverse problems, are notoriously difficult. Right? By and large, you can't solve them. So why 
do we have this inverse problem in the research units? So on the left, I've got the sort of the life in the lab, where you're collecting all these data and you're spending hours and hours generating the data. You write a set of uh, scripts to analyze the data. You come up with simulation models, for example, to try and model the data. You painstakingly create all these results and generalize and these statistics. You spend months and months on this process. You painstakingly write the paper. And that's the thing that the external world reads, that paper. And by and large, what happens over there, I and mean, this is not just months, this is just years of people's life, typically. You've got all of this fluffy stuff on the left hand side. And somehow, by the time it's exported to the right hand side of the diagram, to the real world, to the outside world, they see this very nice shiny paper that's all perfect and pristine. And I think I think Neil gave us some really good examples in the first talk about where these things go wrong. Right? I'm pretty sure that most papers haven't produced one or two serious errors. Right? It's only a question of timing. Right? Science today is so complex, it's very hard to imagine getting everything right the first time. So we do need a lot more scrutiny. Anyway, so this is this is the forward circle. This is the forward problem. Given all of this stuff, how did you generate the paper? With some effort, I could tell you how I generated the paper. But if, as a reader, all you get is my paper, how on earth can you solve the inverse problem? To go back and get the underlying data, or actually get to see it. You just can't. Right? This is just simply not possible. So what I'm trying to push for in science is not that the paper is the is actually this is the product that we could be sharing. And in my endeavors, I'm trying to share more and more of this stuff. And I'm going to give you some And this is not this is not new. Right? This idea has been floating around for many years. This is a quote I've taken from a paper in genome biology about the bioconduction project. Um, it's attributed to Buckeye from Donahoe after John Fairbaum from the States. I'm just going to read. An article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. It is merely advertising for scholarship. So when you get the paper, it's like, oh yeah, that's interesting. But it's only just the, the guide. What you really want, the actual scholarship, is the complete software development environment and that complete set of instructions that generate the paper itself. This is very much my uh, I've come to, along to thinking on the same lines as this, and I hope. I can convince uh, you in the room that this is actually the way forward in a lot of disciplines. Okay. So far, so good. But if I'm going to give you all of my code and my data, aren't I giving away all of my sort of intellectual property? How am I going to stay in it? Right. So it's all very well and good to talk about these nice moral reasons for being an open scientist, which gives the community and itself the problem together. Right. That's not going to get you in the next one. So moral arguments about being an open scientist are great, but they don't cut it completely well. What you need, and I think Neil has already hinted at some of these, is it's good to be selfish, right? There's lots of nice selfish reasons to work for your community. Okay, and some of you may know Florian, Florian Markowitz from the Cancer Research Team. He uh, actually gave a, a session a couple of summers ago, and he wrote, wrote up these, uh, these slides into a little commentary piece in genome biology. And it's really good. It gives you nice things about why you should selfishly care about uh, working in your community. I've got some of these examples on here. Okay, well, top of the list, if you want funding nowadays, you better be starting to, you better be a good citizen, right? The funders are really taking this quite nicely. The Wealth Trust, MRC, and Biosciences, EPSA, for example, Lots and lots of mandates coming along, telling us to share various important data facts. Okay, so far it's mostly quantitative data. I can talk a little bit more about code a bit later. You can now get credit for sharing these, these things in open data papers or in email for the outline. There's lots of places where you can publish your, your software. So you can get credit for this. I don't think these are just floating out there. Be selfish. Right? Use the goal of writing the article. Sharing it. You can be surprised, right? You just don't know what happens when you start, you put stuff out there and you start sharing it. Right? 
it's very easy to lead to uh, future collaborations. I shared some code last year in the project with graduate students. And within about two weeks, two weeks, we got a request from the group in Japan that I've never worked with before. They were already running our code and they wanted some help in extending it. Uh, that's exactly why. Yes, please do. Interrupt you. I agree with you on that, of course, great, great way of talking about data. Um, but what advice do you have for people that are not already prominent or famous and don't even have a large audience of people that follow their research, follow them on social media? How can we get the word out? Um, so the, the, the question, just to repeat it uh, from the screen, is, it's all well and good if you've already got an established research career. Suddenly start sharing. But what if you're not well known? How do you get how do you how do you get traction from doing this? Um, but actually, I think it falls in partly for, for point six. Uh, sorry, this slide. There was point seven. That point seven. Uh, my point seven was actually that now is a very good time to be a reaper, to be a, 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 to be doing this, to be sharing this. It's still the case, unfortunately, that the number of people doing this kind of activity is relatively rare. So that if you do do it, now is a very good time to do it, because other people, I do believe, will start to notice once you've got it uh, advertised in papers. So for example, I, I submitted a data paper a few years ago. And I just thought this was just something almost just Throwaway. We, we couldn't get any proper research science done, so we just wrote it up in the data, data, data set. The novel feature about that data set was we made it all, we made all of the papers fully reproducible, so all of the figures and data could be regenerated. And fortunately, it went to the right reviewer. And one of the reviewers loved it. The reviewer downloaded our repository, started playing with the figures. In his review, he was telling the editor, and I know it's a he because he signed his review. Um, he, he said, well, I wouldn't have analyzed it that way, but actually, it doesn't matter. You've given me the scripts and all of the data, so I can reanalyze the data. So in, in the review that went back, uh, Christoph had actually done his own analysis on our data and included it in his review back to the editor, partly just to show that it could be done, but partly also to make a point. And we changed the figure accordingly, so okay, we don't need to do it. Um, so I think, to answer your question, Laurence, um, it's if you do it now, you're going to get noticed. There's enough other people who still think this is a cool thing to do that you will get noticed. Like Anthony leading the descendants of this, right? I will watch everything he does, right? This is still a rare enough event. In 10 years' time, you won't be able to get as much credit for doing this because it will just be expected. Okay, so now is a very good time to do it. I think you leave it two or three years. I'm hoping that. Um, we've seen this issue in point four about uh, fixing data bugs and errors in analysis. I think the uh, you know the more you expose your data in code, yes, it is embarrassing, and I've had examples of that. So, you know, some mistakes have come back, not too published. You just take a deep breath and say, okay, fair enough. Right? If it's if it's not fraud, you know, if it was fraud, certainly you wouldn't be putting it up there online anyway, right? That would be silly. So it's an honest mistake, and everybody makes honest mistakes. There is no final part of research after that says that's it. There's always going to be further, further analysis and interpretations. Um, I think this is a great reason, selfish reason to share. It prevents data loss, right? If everybody is making sure that they've got at least their primary copy of their data off their laptop and into a, into a data repository, it prevents that data loss, right? I've now had the case many times where I had students just for summer, and it's a real hassle at the end of the summer to ask them to send me all their code and data. Right? So from day one, we set up a GitHub repository and it's shared and it's private, so we don't have to worry about exposing everything where we are. But then I know whenever the student leaves, you know, as it is inevitably you know, they tend to, you've still got the data and code, and you can still work with them when they come back. Most critically, however, I think the person who benefits most from engaging in these sharing activities is you yourself in the future when you come back to a project and you go, what the heck was I doing a year ago? Right? And you plan 
and then where all the bits of code are going to end up. Okay. So your future self is probably the best person to satisfy. If there's no better self, please don't be there. <coughs> so based on this, um, a few of us in uh, I'm a neuroscientists, most of, most of these people are actually neuroscientists, but give you an example. Uh, ben Mark, Ben Marek, some of you might know, is from the uh, University of uh, Washington in Seattle. He's an archaeologist. Right? So we got him involved in, in, in this project. We've got Shoei from the Sustainable Software Institute in uh, Cuban Human Rights. We wrote up a set of guidelines for neuroscientists to try and encourage embed these practices. And all over, I mean, I think it's of general enough, uh, the comments in there are general enough interest. The only sort of neuroscience specific article to sort of mention it makes is actually in terms of which repositories you're recommending that people follow to uh, okay, for other disciplines. If you're not yet sure about where you should be sharing your data or your data repository, my recommendation is go to the FOSS website or to the scientific data website. Journal and nature run and look at their recommendations. They both have very good recommendations for the best repositories to use for your data. So, we've written this, uh, this paper, it's up on the bio archive for a preprint server. Um, and we're actually hoping to take this forward with a, with a leading neuroscience journal, of which I cannot say any more than just yet in the project this space. Um, so, I thought I'd give you some specific recommendations from that paper. Number one is to include enough code to reproduce the key figure for resolved in your paper. Right? This just gets you started. So if you can even get this far and just have, say you have three main results in your paper, right? good enough in my view, and it's all it's not about being perfect, it's about being good enough, right? But getting getting started. So there's a repository in neuroscience called Model DB. The criteria for getting your submission accepted onto Model DB is that somebody else can reproduce. A key figure that you submitted on the okay, and that's very well curated. So that's a principle. Not everything in your paper, if you're not ready yet, you know, don't hold off submitting the paper because you still need Excel to do one figure this figure, this figure, and that figure. But fine, right? Just get started. Get, get one key thing reproduced. Okay. Now, of course, this leads into the problem that a lot of scientific disciplines are now have very large data sets, very large compute requirements. So it's infeasible to imagine that you can actually reproduce something without access to a supercomputer. So we're recommending you provide toy examples just to get started. Show something working on a small scale set of data that the demonstrator can use. Version control is a given. I wasn't listening to that. I can't remember if Neil actually mentioned the word control before. I showed it at least. You showed it. I think that was a picture. Um, who, do, who knows what GitHub is? That's very original. Okay, so I'm hoping that you, GitHub is just flavor of the day. It was slightly worrying, but didn't it go down last week? Or something? Yeah, it was a bad run, so yeah, it went down. Right? I mean, a lot of people rely on GitHub to the extent that if, if it does go down at any length of time, there's a large number of people who are like, ooh, it's getting jittery. Um, and seriously, that is a, that is a problem. I was speaking to the Wellcome Trust, they they have a concern that you can't rely on on, on, uh, on GitHub and whether they should be investing in alternative alternative practice. I'm not so worried. I think GitHub will eventually disappear one day and hopefully we can translate most of our stuff onto other people's code. Um, it's very important to think about licensing issues. Okay, it's all very good at sharing your code unless you're explicit about the conditions under which it's be shared, then people won't be able to take full advantage of it. Um, you obviously need to be able to provide enough of your own data. Yes? Can I ask a question for licensing? Why would you take ten months to hold that data? So it's a question you for code that you want to be open. Because if someone builds on your code, you can force them to open it. That's 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 a fantastic question. So the question is I I picked on the slide, I picked the MIT license. And the question is whether why why should we use something like copy that? So here I have to reveal my uh, my heritage. Um, actually, I think my first endeavors in this field were in the mid nineties, when Richard Stallman convinced me to work on Emacs. 
this rhythm. And he invented Popula. Everything we did was Popula. For years and years, I just keep on institutionalized the sign of Popula. I've actually been convinced that Popula is not the, I don't think Popula is. Can you explain Popula? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So that was the question. What is copyleft? Mm -hmm. So copyleft is a, uh, you can say in the name, there's copyright. Copyleft is kind of like anti-copyleft, anti-copyleft. If you put your, if you release your code under copyleft, what it means, it's like a viral form. It's like a viral form of uh, copyright. So if I release it under copyleft, it means you're free to do whatever you want with it. Here's the source code, go off and do whatever, whatever you want with it. If you're a company, you can go off and use my code, you can go and edit my code. But if you then want to sell your product, you can even sell your product. But what you have to do is to make the code available under the same license as copyright. So that other people can then see your code. And then of course the IP inference then being, why are you going to make money from your make money from your from your product, your commercial product, is so everybody else can buy it. Can just download the source code for free. <coughs> so some people think that's a great <coughs> vision of the universe, and certainly Richard Sorbonne does, and I think we've benefited a lot from that. But I think in this modern era where code is ubiquitous, the MIT license is for people to say, look, I don't I just want it used, get it out there. And I think for certain scientific things, I think that's that's absolutely fine. Right? It's a personal decision. Um, I think if you want to stick with copy left, I think that's a very happy with that. Okay, yeah. So the, the comment for the screen was that uh, by using MIT, it may be by, by being more relaxed and may encourage companies to be more reasonable. I think that's a very pragmatic approach. I think that's why a lot of places have a lot of them. Um, I, I, not everything I have is under MIT, a lot of it's still at GPL. Okay, so. Providing data, you need to provide data. Providing tests, so I'm also self-taught, and I think Neil is also an expert. There's a lot of there's a lot of things we can learn from software engineering disciplines, and I think testing is the number one thing. Um, it's very rare still that I write a lot of tests. It's a profession. I think I should be writing more. Um, and uh, I'm my best. But having tests encourages yourself when you change things that things are still working, which is always reassuring, and it gives other people. Uh, using standards is important, and finally using permanent URLs is uh, very important. So when you come to publish your software, it's great. Add the web page, you say, right, and the scales of sharing your code, right? For about three or four years ago, another secret was that I was still writing in my papers. If you like my code, just email me, I'll send it to you. I've written that. Um, I then went, oh, I can do a web URL. So I put a URL in. It's my home page, which uh, probably now doesn't work in one or two cases. Um, this, the long term solution is to use uh, permanent DOIs, which, for example, the Nodo could share from the install so that they are synchronous with the same DOIs. Although it's great to see GitHub in uh, papers, you can hardly do GitHub in GitHub if you have to spend five minutes, and it is only five minutes. What does this actually mean for us as, uh, as uh, people writing software and uh, putting it into papers? Um, I now have the view that I try and make my papers sort of where, where the project is small enough that they can all be recomputed dynamically by somebody else. So this is an example of a figure, figure two from a paper that I wrote last year. It's a review paper, and it's all fully reproducible. So that if somebody wants to Edit my uh, program scripts. They can. They can change the uh, change the algorithms and see the effect of running it. Um, they can rerun the thing and they'll get a nicely formatted PDF. Yeah. 
So I think this is the way forward. It takes a lot of time to get to this point, but I think it's not something that you can immediately do one day. But it really gives you a lot of faith in your papers that you can be encouraged to change the way that you analyze your results and not worry about having to, to regenerate all the physical manuals. This automation is really critical uh, to getting you to, to try new things. So I'm going to talk now in a little bit of detail about some new tools that I Depending on the audience's reaction, I'm going to spend one minute, three minutes on. Um, the most important one that I, I think has really changed the way that I work in the last few years is Docker. So who knows what Docker is? So for the, the roughly half of you who haven't seen Docker yet, uh, just a little plug, we're actually having a workshop in Cambridge at the end of June on Docker. So the, I think for sort of new users as well as the past users. Um, I'll try and advertise that as soon as properly, or if you want to come already, just drop me a message. I'm hoping you might be interested in the talk. So, Docker is it's a, it's a sort of just the latest in our trend of ways of virtualizing your software environment. So, it's great to have somebody's code. You can look at it and you can try and study what they've done. But what you really want to do is just run it for yourself. And it's very easy to, to think that you've got all your dependencies worked out, but it's actually incredibly painful to change the way you operate. So Docker is like uh, going to uh, getting your own specialist ice cream van and the ice cream uh, ice cream van. And you start from a base, which is pretty vanilla, it's like a Linux distribution, the cone, and then you can add whatever you want on top of it to customize your ice cream just the way you want it. So Docker is pretty similar. What you can do is you start with a vanilla installation of Linux, very much Linux. And then on top of it, you say, well, okay, this is a project that uses R, so I'm going to put in the R thing, and on top of the R, I need these image processing tools. And, sh and so your Docker specifically, it's just a, a Docker file, it's really it's a, it's a short text file which just says, these are all the things I need, and then go and get me the GitHub repository where the code is stored and so on. And then by the time you've built a Docker image, which is successfully runs, I have a lot of confidence that I've got all of the dependencies worked out and that somebody else, anywhere else in the universe, can go off and reproduce that analysis just by doing these simple little steps. Start up Docker, pushed it to this thing called Docker Hub, get that GitHub, that stores these, uh, these Docker files and their images, and I can guarantee that once you've got Docker, you can reproduce my paper just by running it. This line will get, get the software, it's going to get the documents. And then this line will open a web page that looks something like this. You've got the LaTeX code, you've got the underlying R code, and all of the packages that you need to produce the my analysis. Now, I think that is fantastic and it's a game changer. Right? But still, it's not done that, that often. Right? A number of times I've seen Docker images and I've seen paper. Right? Docker may not be around in five years' time. That doesn't matter. There'll be other technologies. It's the idea of getting this reproducible research paradigm that I find really interesting. So, dirty secrets time. Okay. I learned to my costs. I thought, oh, wow, this is great. I published my first paper with a Docker image. This is wonderful. It's going to be great. Right? Sometime after, shortly after publishing it, it broke. And I didn't even know about it. Right, so I didn't have my automated testing on. So it broke roughly, I worked out, it probably broke about six months after I released it. And it broke just because of a really ch silly change to a LaTeX package that was included in the, because I needed LaTeX to reproduce the, the paper. There's a small, very small LaTeX package. I didn't even know that that was used in any package and that I need it. It changed. It broke my, uh, it broke my interest. So don't think that just because you've got Docker image out there, it's fine. It's not, you need to look after it. Um, but there are ways of looking after it. This is a paradigm called continuous integration, which is like effectively just periodically rerunning it to check that everything is still there. Okay. And just recently, a famous blogger, Titus Brown, in 2015, uh, wrote this nice article, How I Learned to Stop Worrying for the Upcoming Archivability Crisis. So this is a problem, right? You're never always going to be reproducible forever. Let it go, right? Get a 
getting it good enough for the next two or three years. So another tool that Neil has already actually hinted at is this paradigm for mixing sort of code with, uh, with text into, into one document. The latest of those that seems to be very successful is Jupyter, and this seems to be very, very nice. Um, so you can embed, uh, here's a snippet of some Python code surrounded by some text and some math. So you can read these notebooks online, and you know that if you want, you can just get that code and re rerun it for yourself, run it locally, and you can pick this all up and say, okay, so this is really nice. Um, I'm not interested in that, it's great, but you can actually see this and you pick them up and you can see it. So now, now what we can do is actually we can put together these tools. Right? So we've got this Docker thing which allows me to reproduce and share my environment. We've got this Jupyter notebook, so it's a nice way of describing what you've done and the code to come to do it. All you need is a little bit of cloud computing infrastructure, for example, uh, Amazon or Microsoft Azure. Put those three together, and what you've got is a very nice ecosystem for sharing reproducibly your research. And somebody has done this, uh, MyBinder, uh, the product of uh, Jimmy Neal's farm in the Greenland lab. Um, so if you go to this website, you can actually not just look at their notebooks and analyze that, but you can actually dynamically recompute the, uh, the analysis on the cloud. It's not done on the laptop, it's done actually on the cloud. And you don't even have to pay the bill. Okay? So Andrew Freeman is doing this, or the, or the NIH is looking at the building right now. Um, I think this is a fantastic way of looking at this going forward. I've actually just submitted a free application to Rob. And there are a couple of examples if you just want to go through. So those are all of the new tools, right? That's that's great. It's nice to see the shanty and the snazzy new things. But actually, I think you can get by a long way on some of the older tools. Right? So what are the old tools that this is going on? So first of all, the simplest thing is just to find a find a code flow. Right? I think Mike and Patrick have already written this one. Can you just get somebody else? Forget about solving the re reproducibility of this. You know, mine is universally reproducible across great countries. Isn't it good enough if you can also just get somebody else, right? Not just you on your laptop to reproduce this, right? So give your code to somebody else and just say, can you repeat my analysis for me? And see, you know, see what you learn by watching them do it. Okay? So just as with the, uh, the example from the, uh, the Harvard study, uh, the Randolph study, um, for many years now, it's one of the assignments on the graduate program here. We ask students to reproduce a paper. Right? This is a great exercise. Right? Just say, go and find an interesting paper that you've read in nature or science. Make sure it's got the data available, but then we'll try and repeat their analysis. Can we do that? And inevitably, the answer might be yes. Can we do that? If we can get something right with someone else, but they've found that there, is, there are always going to be gaps. Okay. Um, we also asked the students at a later point just to try and use this reproducibility thing. This is uh, this is the RN couple which is one of the hard users of this open notebook for Linux. So I tell my students for one particular assignment, rather than submitting a PDF where they know what it all looks like, you know, I say, I don't know what this looks like. Give me the notebook and I will regenerate your analysis. Okay. If it doesn't comply, you get a zero. Okay. So there's a very big incentive for them to actually make sure this is reproducible. So these are the sort of, I think, the pragmatic things you can do to build bridge today without, uh, without any effort. Um, so this is my, excuse me, a lot of you do know the GitHub repository. So this is actually, uh, apologies to Arthur Smith from GitHub, I saw uh, this is the second most important file. So his argument was the second most important file in GitHub repository is the read notebook. Okay. Let everybody think of this. The first most important is the first most Okay, so who's going to take a punt? What's the third most important part? Guess this. Any, uh, what do you think is the third most important part? 
Attribution, that's a good one. Collaboration. Hacking. Documentation. All right, these are all good. So my favorite for the third most right? This is I think they're all good suggestions. My third, third favorite is make fun. I get really happy when I see somebody's repository and they can make fun. If they're using make, it means that they've actually been thinking about these things that need an entire language. Like uh, automation. Right? So who's heard of makes make files? Who actually writes make files? So you should all be writing make files. They will save your brain a lot of hurt. They're a very old tool, and they used to be used traditionally for you know, recompiling software. Right? You can use it very easily in an introducible research framework. So I would not, if you have not uh, used one of the other companies, I would not recommend it. Because it's quite a lot of work. Yeah, so it's not a good idea. Yeah, 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 it's not a good idea. I quite often work on many projects over many years, and my memory is not what it used to be. I can't remember what I did yesterday. So I make sure that I don't have to remember it, as long as I've got a make file, which always just has, if I, just by typing make, it will rerun all of the analysis that I have. Okay. It, it does what the psychologists do, we call reducing confidence in work. I don't have to remember, you shouldn't have to remember. It's not just about being lazy, it's about taking advantage of these resources. So that's my that's one of my top recommendations. Um, finally, some practical tips. Um, how can we change this universe right, in practical ways so that this, this is happening more and more often? Um, first of all, I think you can start by lobbying your favorite journal if they don't already have a statement about sharing the code, is just to ask them. One in place, right? give them some suggestions for what to do. Likewise, lobby the funders. I think you're knocking on an open door now. I've been uh, trying this with the MRC, the Wealth and Trust, and they've all been equally successful. Um, Neil's already mentioned that I think in reviewing articles, you should be able to ask for the code to actually uh, be made available to you, right? not necessarily to, to check it as part of your review, but so that you should just be aware of it. Um, and just when starting on new projects, always think that one day somebody else will be looking at this piece of code. I will always try and get you there. And when I tell my students to do this, it changes the quality of the code instantly. And they start writing comments like nice, thank you, because somebody else might be looking at this. So, in closing, what we need to do is to find the selfish reasons to make research really useful. This is, this is critical. Convince yourself, what, why am I actually doing this? Forget about the moral convenience. Try and look at these good practice articles. I think the good enough article that was just recently went up on our time is a great thing. Don't think about being best, just get started. Um, writing code in groups is incredibly motivating. And yes, use these new technologies if you like them, if you want to, but the old tech works just fine. Um, oh, I can tell you what I do. I don't think it's standard, but I think it's good enough, which is R, um, basically. Um, my GitHub repository tends to have a data folder, which is sort of read only, and I leave that well alone. And then I have a set of scripts that will mine those data sets and turn them into figures. Um, and I always worry if ever in terms of generating a figure, somebody wants to touch it up in my Photoshop, you know, the montage or anything. So as soon as you ever need a tool that you need to compile your figure, in my view, you're not going to be reproducing it. You know, so 
is away from the laptop, you know, come back. So whatever, I mean, like Python, R, <laughs> MATLAB, all of these tools have very good ways of generating high quality figures. Invest the time in learning how to use those, and of course you've got scripts as well to make figures, make figure one. So that's, I think, all you need. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. I think there's plenty there for us all to try out and pass back. So we say thank you to Stephen again. <laughs>